is a bill that's going to be going to the Knesset. We're going to seek to allow lots of different worship up on the Temple Mount. And there are a lot of reasons why that is not going on right now. One is just political. The second reason is uh, political. <laughs> the third reason is political. But anyway, I just thought this was real interesting. This just came out uh, in this morning's uh, Jerusalem Post. But let's go to Zechariah 14, 16, 14, 16. And we can see a prophetic pre fulfillment just in, in having having this happen. We'll see. It still has to go to the Knesset. The Knesset has to do it. And of course, whatever political hurdles that need to be jumped will have to be jumped. But one of the reasons that there are some Hebrews that actually are not in favor of it is based on the fact that there is no third temple there yet. And they want, wouldn't want any Jew to pass through what would be or is the Holy of Holies. So they want to be very careful about that. And so it doesn't have unanimity within the Jews that this should take place. It'll be interesting. But in Zechariah 14, 16, whether the Knesset passes it or not, at some point all nations are coming to the Temple Mount to worship. There in Zechariah 14, after Armageddon, and uh, pick up at 16, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of the Tabernacles. No more Passover. There isn't necessary a Passover anymore because redemption has been complete. The law and the prophets totally fulfilled but we're still going to be celebrating the Feast of the Tabernacle. The Tabernacle is God with us. And as we know in our studies that the day of Jesus incarnate, his birthday is during the Feast of Tabernacles. And that was the one time when the priests could go into the Holy of Holies. But now that the veil is rent, this is going to be a great celebration. Looking back to the time when that wasn't allowable for everybody, and just a celebration of that will be. So I just thought it was very interesting to see that, that happen. It's going to happen at some point, but it may happen in our lifetime where all the nations can go up and uh, worship there on the Temple Mount. All right, we're in Jeremiah. And today we're going to look at one of the pinnacles of the tenets of truth in Jeremiah. But in order to get there, we're going to start in Hebrews. So we're going to work backwards today. And we looked last week about the promises of the return of the Hebrews to Jerusalem, the restoration of the land, the restoration and redemption of all children during the millennial reign. And let's pick up in Hebrews and we'll see what the writer of Hebrews emphasized there. Hebrews 8 says, this is regarding the new covenant. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also is he the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, and then he quotes from Jeremiah. So this entire passage here is where we're going to be in Jeremiah today. Behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So this is an all-inclusive covenant. Now remember, Israel has already been taken captive by the Assyrians, and those tribes have been dispersed. The prophet Jeremiah was the prophet to who? To Judah. But yet he's prophesying with regard to Judah and Israel, both kingdoms. Verse 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, I regarded them not, said the Lord. 
And that was the problem with that covenant, is that God kept his promise, but the people did not keep theirs. And for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind. I will write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Want the clue on how to be a person unto God? Have the word of God where? In your mind. Where? In your heart. And that's the distinction. And that was the problem. That's why Jeremiah started out in his prophecy saying, it's your heart. You have a heart problem. Your heart has been hard towards the Lord. Soften your heart. Because Jeremiah is nothing but a love letter. It's just a love letter asking the people to come back for restoration. Love it. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Their sin and their iniquities I will remember no more. In that he said, a new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So even in Jeremiah's time, even Moses spoke of a new covenant. Moses, after he'd given the law, he spoke toward a day when there would be a circumcision, not just of the flesh, but of the heart. A circumcision of the heart. He said, that day will come. And Jeremiah says, that day will come. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, yes, yes, that, that day is coming. And we're on that road. So let's go back to Jeremiah and let's put it in context. This will be fun. This will be fun. So we started with the restoration of Israel. Let's pick it up in Jeremiah 31, 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. And this is just what, what we just read. And we're going to look at it in, in the context to the, the people, not just in Jerusalem, but also remember, at this point, he's writing to those who've already been taken captive in Babylon. Very interesting scenario. You have Jeremiah teaching in Jerusalem and also sending letters to Babylon. Ezekiel is in Babylon already, and he's speaking to the Babylonians, well, to the Israelis who are there in Babylon, and also sending letters back to Judah. So they're, they're crossing paths here, but they're saying the same thing. Okay, Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, said the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was a husband to them, said the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, write it in their hearts, they will be my God, I will be their people, they will be my people, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Alright. So in this context, in spite of all this destruction and all their devastation, the devastation of Jerusalem Jerusalem will be total. It will be total devastation but it will not be final. And that's the distinction. Yeah, Jerusalem, it will be totally devastated. But Jerusalem is not through. We're not through with Jerusalem. Let's read up 35. Thus saith the Lord, which gives the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon, and of the stars for a light by night, which divided the sea, when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. So he's talking about the laws. We call them the laws of nature. And we can call them whatever that we want to. They're the laws of God. They're the laws of God. He said, look, I have these ordinances. I have this covenant with the sea and with the stars and with the celestial body. And they follow my covenant. They follow my law. And that's the reason, because of the way that the Lord has constructed the universe, because there is certainty. That's what allows us to go to the moon. That's what allows us to send a little rover to Mars. Because we understand the laws, and we understand the principles, and they're finite, and they're definite, they're absolute, they're truths. They're truths, and the formulas and the equations are absolute truths. And 
And that's what allows us to do these things because it doesn't waver and it doesn't change. And the Lord is saying, look, these are my ordinances. The sun and the moon and the seas and the celestial bodies do my bidding. So he ties that in in this hope in 36. If these ordinances depart from before me, said the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Here's the promise. Here's the promise that Jeremiah from the Lord is given to the Jews. He's giving this to the Jews. He's saying, look, it looks like this nation is going to be destroyed forever. At this point in time, we're in about five... 588, we're about 588 B.C. The siege walls are already being built by Nebuchadnezzar. The Babylonians are there. They lay siege almost about two years in the city. So they're already building their ramparts, and they're visible from the city walls. And at this stage, it looks like there's no hope. There's no way to get out. And what the Lord is saying here, look, Israel has as much chance of going away as the moon, the stars, the light, the sea, all that. It's under the same compact. It's under the same ordinance. Now, if there is coming a day when the seas and the celestial heavens break apart and the moon fades away, okay, well, yeah, then it's possible that Israel will go away too. But as long as these things stand firm, Israel will stand a promise. What a promise. So in the midst of this devastation, you say, look, it is not final. This is not final. Okay. 37. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel from all that they have done, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the city shall be built to the Lord from the tower of Hananiel unto the gate of the corner. All right. So, a lot of hope, even in the midst of this devastation, a lot of hope. And what's interesting here, uh, we're talking about two restorations. Jeremiah was very clear this departure was going to last for 70 years. And he talks about the building of the city rebuilding of the city. And he, the starting point is where? From the tower of Hananiel unto the gate of the corner. Hey, we've done Nehemiah. Nehemiah. How do our gates go? How do our gates go? We have <coughs> the city of David. Okay, we have the, how, when we start, we started this what? She? Right? We have the sheep gate, and the sheep gate was where they brought all the sheep in. You know, all the sheep that were going to, number one, go go to be sold, they would come into the sheep, and most of the sheep that were produced in this region came from Bethlehem. Came from Bethlehem. So we have the sheep gate. What's next? Fish gate. The tower of Hananiel is right here. It's a watchtower. And okay, then after the fish gate, what do we have? We have the old gate. Okay. And then, when Jeremiah was walking, he walked down and went to the valley gate. And in and, and our studies in Jeremiah, remember, this, this tells, it tells the story. The gates, and when Nehemiah was walking around here, it tells the story of, of redemption. It's, it's the story of redemption. So he's walking, and the walls are totally broken down. And so you have the sheep, and what, we're like sheep. How many times do we refer to as sheep? All the time. We need a shepherd. And then when Jesus first calls the disciples, what does he tell them to do? I'm going to make you fishers of men. We're all called. All of us. All of us. We're, we're called to do what? To walk in the old ways. Walk in the ways. Walk in the statutes of truth. Walk in that ancient truth and absolute truth. We're called to do that. But what happens? All like sheep have gone uh, astray. And so we end up where? We end up down here in this valley. We're walking around in the valley. And then what happens after the valley? But it's worse. What was, the very, what was at the very bottom? The lowest, the lowest part of the city was what? No. The dung gate. It's the dung gate. The very lowest part. That's as low as you can go in Jerusalem. Is the dung gate. 
And so you're going through the dung gate, and then what happens? The highest point, then from the dung, up here there's a, a, a jump. It's on the it's on the back side. We can't sit on this map, but it's this jump in elevation up here to the fountain gate. Fountain. So you're lifted up to the fountain gate, the red pool of Siloam, and, and there's just cleansing, there's washing away. And then what's the next gate? The water gate. The washing of the water by the Word. You're instructed in the Word of God. You're taught the Word of God. And that's how you stand. And then what happens? You join this great chorus of saints and witnesses that have gone before the army of God. And what's the next gate? It's the horse gate. That's where, the, that's where the army, the army would gather. The army would gather, and when, when David or his forces or the army would come out, they would come to the horse gate, and it was a wider gate. They'd go out to battle, and then they'd come back in. And then after that, what gate do you have? Well, you have what we call the eastern gate, right? Uh, but it was also called the gate, gate beautiful by Peter, because it was a very, very beautiful gate. And this is a gate, what, that Jesus, that Jesus came in. Jesus came in during the triumphal entry uh, during the uh, East Gate, and so you have this—you have this great, this great victory. You have this great victory, and then we've got the Munster Gate, Munster Gate, and that is where you would bring recruits in. That's where you'd bring recruits in to join the military, to join the army, the Gate of Inspection, the Gate of Munster. So you see this, this this walk from sheep and being called and walking in the ways of God. You end up in the valley, you end up in the dump. You're lifted up into the fountain. And you're cleansed by the washing of the word. You join the armies of God in that triumphant. And then what do you do with the mustard gate? You go bring other people in too. You recruit. That's the recruitment gate. The recruitment office was right there at the inspection gate. Let's look at something fun while we're here in Nehemiah. Let's go to Nehemiah 3 for where this is. <coughs> Maya Esther Job Sons. Okay. But we're just gonna so we're gonna scan this and we're gonna skim this. So we're gonna skim that. Okay. Then Elisha bid the high priest rose up with his brother the priest. They they built it, what, the sheep gate. So that's where we're starting. Sanctified it, set up the doors. And let's go to verse 3 now. We've got the fish gate. That's next. The fish gate gets what? It's get, it gets built. And then you have the list. And what's fascinating is Nehemiah went into great detail to list everybody. Everybody, their family, their neighbors, their sons, everybody who had a part in building the kingdom. <laughs> Everybody really rebuilding the kingdom here. Everybody who had a part in rebuilding the kingdom, they got their name in the book. And not much has changed since the days of the new mind. I mean, we can build our own kingdoms. It's fine. We'll go ahead. Or you can build the kingdom of God. I didn't get the name in the book. All right. And so they're repairing all these things. Verse 6, the old gate, it's what? It's repaired. All right. Okay, let's keep on. Let's find the next gate. Verse 13. Verse 13, right? Valley gate. The valley gate is what? Repair. Okay, not valley gate. What's next? Five. I'm 14. 14. The dung gate. Repair. Next. Verse 15. The fountain gate. Repair. And then you see all this reparation. The fountain gate is there by the pool of Siloam. See that in verse 15 by the king's garden and the stairs that go down from the city of David. Now David has built some built some stairs there because it's such a height, such a difference in elevation. And remember when Nehemiah, when Nehemiah was walking at he, at first he started with his little horse, the mule, and he was going around but he couldn't get up there because it was too high. <coughs> so they were still good. And so it's verse 17 repaired, 18 repaired, 19 repaired, 20 repaired, 21 repaired. So they're doing all these Reparations, and then let's go up to verse verse 26. Moreover, the Nephilim dwelt in Ophel, which means a place of eminence. 
they're dwelling there. That's kind of where they were living. Unto the place over against the water gate towards the east and the tower that lieth out. And then after that, the Tekoites repaired another piece over against the great tower that lieth out, even to the wall of Ophel. 28, horse gate, repaired. We have the keeper of the east gate in 29, repaired. Verse 31, the Mikpad, that's the muster gate, repaired. Every single one of these gates, every single one of these gates was knocked down and had to be repaired except one gate. One gate did not need reparation. One gate, in spite of Nebuchadnezzar's siege and whatever else he tried to do, is the water gate. The water gate stood. And what did we, we start out with John in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh. The Word is forever, and that represents the Word of God. The Word of God doesn't go away. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter who comes against it. And there's a lot of folks in our country today that are coming against the Word of God. Well, good luck with that. Hmm. Nebuchadnezzar couldn't do it, and they can't either. Men with greater power, with greater authority, Nero, go down the list. Hitler, go down the list. Nobody destroys the Word of God, and he left that impression so we could visually see it. It doesn't matter who you are, the Word of God stands. You want to build, you want something? Build on the Word of God. Okay. We can go with the Chick-fil-A. You need a lot of chicken, a lot of chicken, right? But you know, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's, a sign, it's a sign of the times. It's just a sign of the times. And the Lord, you know, the Lord has told us these things are coming. And when he said, when you see these things, look up. Your redemption is drawing nigh, but it's our it's our right, it's our right to occupy the land. And because I have in this country, because I'm guaranteed the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion, the freedom of religion is more than just being allowed to go to religious services on Sunday. It's being able to live my life out under the precepts of the tenets of absolute truth, the word of God. I have that right to live my life that way. <laughs> okay, well that was kind of fun. Okay, let's go back to Jeremiah. Well, I thought. It's <laughs> All right. Let's go back to Jeremiah. Let's put this together. We get some better, better, better. Jeremiah 30. Okay, so the Tower of Hanmiel, and that's up at this, this top tower, and that's, that's where they started the work. That's where it's already, it's all going to get rebuilt, guys. It's coming back. It's, it's coming back. And uh, let's see, 39. And the measuring line shall go forth over against it upon the hill Gareb, and shall compass about to go out. Okay, it's, it's going to be the whole thing. The whole thing's going to be rebuilt. And then we come back and see again in Nehemiah. Now, we're looking also prophetically to the future. And the whole valley of dead bodies and the ashes and all the fields upon the brook can run into the corner of the horse gate. Corner of the horse gate. Towards the east shall be holy unto the Lord. It shall not be plucked up or thrown down for forevermore. This, if, if I were to switch it towards our map, we would flip it this way because this is the eastern side of Jerusalem, and that's the eastern gate right now. And just like Ezekiel said, when Ezekiel described this gate, he's right now in our timeline. Daniel is about 30 years old. Ezekiel has been prophesying about five years, and he gets he gets a vision of this gate that he's never seen before because he describes it differently. Stairs going up to the gate, that it's all sealed in. And when Solomon the Great rebuilt this part of the wall in the seventh century, they blocked that gate up, and understanding that that was the gate that the Bible prophesies the Messiah's coming through. So they bricked it up saying, we'll keep Jesus out. Not only will we do that, they planted this cemetery in front of it. And for any Jew to walk through a cemetery would make them unclean. So we're going to lock it up and we're going to put the cemetery, and that'll keep Jesus out of there. Something very interesting, when Arafat 
the terrorist, right before he died, one of the things he was trying to do was to open this gate because he wanted to go through it. He wanted to go through the gate. He didn't live long enough to go through the gate, did he? Somebody's going through that gate, and the next person that goes through that gate is going to be Jesus Christ. And we're going to be right behind him. And that's, that's part of what we're going to see today. All right. So this entire valley, and the valley of Har Armageddon, and you have this battle, and we have this valley, and Jesus comes down to the Mount of Olives, and just with one word, and he doesn't come to destroy the world. Jesus comes to stop those who are trying to destroy the world. <coughs> so this valley is going, is, going to be whole, is going to be holy to the Lord. And then Jeremiah does something very, very interesting here. Let's pick up verse 3, too. So, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. So, we're able to time this out all perfectly. This is, this is about five, this is 588. 588. For then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison, which was in the king of Judah's house. So because of what Jeremiah had been saying, he's back in jail. So the siege of Jerusalem is going on. Nebuchadnezzar has come. He's building up his ramparts. Jeremiah's in jail in the king's house with the king's guards. Make sure this guy's not getting out of here. Three, for Zedekiah, king of Judah, had shut him up, saying, Wherefore dost thou prophesy, and say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. So Zedekiah was mad. He said, You are saying that Nebuchadnezzar is going to win. That's what you're saying. And so he, stick, he put him back in jail. Remember, Jeremiah had been in jail before, but only for a day. Now Zedekiah said, that's it, I'm through with you. So he sticks them back in the jailhouse. Verse 4. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him mouth to mouth, and his eyes shall behold his eyes. Fascinating prophet. So he's telling Zedekiah, not only is he going to take the city, he's going to take you personally. You're going to speak with him, and you're going to see him with your eyes. Look at the detail. You're going to speak to him, you're going to see him with your eyes, and he shall leave. Fascinating. You're going to speak, you're going to see him, and then what's he going to do? He's going to lead you. He's going to lead you to Babylon. And there shall he be until I visit him, saith the Lord. Though ye fight with the Chaldeans, you shall not prosper. And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Behold, and Emil the son of Shalom, that uncle, shall come to thee, saying, Buy thee my field that is Anathra, but the right of redemption is thine. Okay, let's stop here with this prophecy, and let's compare it. We looked at the civil record last week. Let's look at the biblical record, and let's compare the two. Civil record is actually pretty, I mean, pretty, pretty accurate, but let's go to the Bible. We're going to pick this up in Ezekiel 12. Contemporaneous with this writing, Ezekiel's already in Babylon. I mean, Ezekiel's been there for a while, and he's writing this, Ezekiel 12. And we're going to compare the two. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. Daniel's writing his prophecies too. He's already out of the lion's den. Already out of the fiery furnace. And let's go to Ezekiel and pick it up in chapter 12. And let's compare the two. Okay. The word of the Lord also came to me saying, Son of man, Thou dwellest in the midst of a rebellious house, which have eyes to see, and see not. They have ears to hear, and hear not, for they are a rebellious house. Okay, 
So even Ezekiel in this the same time frame, these same crossing letters, he's talking about eyes. They have eyes to see, but they don't. They don't use them. They don't use them. They have ears to hear, they don't use them. Three. Therefore thou son of man, prepare thy stuff for removing, and remove by day in the sight, and thou shalt remove from thy place to another in thy sight. And may be they will consider, though they be a rebellious house. Then shalt thou bring forth the stuff by day in the sight, the stuff for removing, and thou shalt go forth, and even in their sight, as they that go forth into captivity. Dig thou through the wall in their sight, and carry out their body. In the sight shalt thou bear it upon their shoulders, and carry it forth in the twilight. Thou shalt cover thy face, and thou not see the ground, for I have set thee for a sign in the house of Israel. And I did so as I was commanded. Okay, so what the Lord is telling Ezekiel, Ezekiel, I want to act this out. Get, get your thing, get your bags, pack your bags, and I want you to dig a hole, and I want you to go beyond the wall. And so Ezekiel says, hey, I did that. And I did so what I was commanded. I brought my stuff forth by the day, that stuff for captivity, and in the evening I digged through the wall with my hand. I brought it forth in the twilight, I bare it upon my shoulder in their sight, and in the morning came the word of the Lord saying to me, saying, Son of man, Hath not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said unto thee, What doest thou? And thou said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, This burden concerning the prince in Jerusalem, and all the house of Israel that are among them. So I said, well, What does this mean? Well, this I'm speaking, I'm speaking to the prince in Jerusalem. I'm, I'm speaking to the, to the king here. And to all his house. Verse 11. I am your sign. Like as I have done, so shall it be done unto them. They shall remove and go into the Just like you've seen me carry my stuff, that's exactly what's going to happen to them. They're going to be taking their stuff, they're going to be leaving Jerusalem, and they're going into captivity. Verse 12. And the prince that is among them shall bear upon his shoulder in the twilight, and shall go forth. <clears throat> they shall dig through the wall to carry out their body. He shall cover his face that he not the ground see with his eyes. My neck also will I spread upon him, and he shall be taken in my snare. And I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans, yet shall he not see it, though he shall die. So Ezekiel sent in this letter back to Jerusalem. You know, get your stuff, you're going to be leaving, and what happens to Zedekiah? Well, after the ramparts are built, he and his family, they try to sneak out, and they dig this hole, and they take their stuff out, and he says, you will not see it, you won't see it, you won't see it, you won't see it, but you'll find it. Okay, well let's go to 2 Kings 25, and let's see how this fits together. 2 Kings 25. The fall of Jerusalem. And it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came. He and all the hosts pitched against Jerusalem and pitched against it, and they built forts against it round about, and the city was besieged unto the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. And we just saw, when was this letter, Jeremiah was in the tenth year. So, we were right in the middle of the siege, we're in the center of the siege. Verse 3, and on the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine prevailed in the city, for there was no bread for the people of the land, and the city was broken up for all the men of war fled by night by the way of the gate between two walls, which is the king's garden. Now the Chaldees were against the city round about, and the king went the way toward the plain. And the army of the Chaldeans pursued after the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho. And all his army were scattered from him. So they took the king brought him up to the king of Babylon to Riblah, and they gave judgment upon him, and they slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and put out the eyes of Zedekiah, and bound him with fetters 
the brass and carried him to Babylon. So you see, both prophecies came to pass. Jeremiah was saying, no, you, you will be going to Babylon. And Ezekiel was saying, you'll die there, but you won't see it. You will not see it. You'll see and speak to Nebuchadnezzar. You'll see him, you'll speak to him, you'll not see Babylon. That's because they touch his eyes on. And you look back to Ezekiel, they have eyes, but they don't see. So what's the use of having eyes? You're the king. And so that that prophecy came to pass there. And that's particularly cruel. Nebuchadnezzar was a very, very cruel man. And what he wanted out of Zedekiah, the last thing you're going to see in this earth is going to be me killing your son. And that's the last visual image he had that he took with him to his bed. All right. So we've solved that riddle. Let's go back to Jeremiah and let's finish this out. So he's buying this field. Okay. Uh, he has a nephew. Let's pick it up in verse 7. Uh, Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shalom, but an uncle, shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field that is in Anathoth. For the right of redemption is thine to buy it. Now, the right of redemption we get out of Leviticus. Let's go to Leviticus 25 and see this right of redemption for the land. And we can see what the Lord's plan was when he gave them this land as an inheritance. Leviticus 25, 24.
and it shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be to you, and ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it for thy vine and dress, for it is the jubilee. It shall be holy unto you, and ye shall eat the increase thereof out of your field. In the year of this jubilee, ye shall return every man unto his possession. And what it states out in the rest of Leviticus, let's say that you were going to redeem your kinsmen, and it was like three years to the year of jubilee. And the jubilee was going to come in three years. Well, then the price of redemption would be that prorated three years. So Jubilee was a fulfillment of all sins. All sins are forgiven. All debts are forgiven. Completely blank. And you can never be dispossessed out of land. You can never be dispossessed from the promise of God. When God says, I give this to you, it's yours. Well, what if I goof it up? I still be What if I mess it up? I still be Because God will redeem it. The kids will redeem it. And that's what redemption is all about. You get it all back. And if you take, when Nehemiah came back and he built these walls... He reinstituted the practice of Jubilee. Remember, he read the word that people were crying, and you can take that leap 49 years, Jubilee, 49 years, 49, 49, 49, 49. And when you cross over to the ministry of Jesus Christ, what did he come to say? I've come to give liberty to the captives. He opened his ministry during that Feast of Tabernacles during the year of Jubilee. Do they still do that in the day Yeah. They're how their starting. Works? They're starting it. It hadn't gone by the Knesset. What they wanted to do, at the point in time when there are more Jews living in Israel than all the rest of the world, and when, when there's that tipping point, they want to go back to Jubilee. No, that's, uh, they've just set that, that standard. But Jubilee is absolute, utter, complete forgiveness for everything. And what's significant, I don't know some folks have to go, but what's significant about that, and we'll pick it up next week with Jeremiah buying that field, the Romans, the Romans, the Babylonians are encompassed about them. The Romans are next. Yeah. <laughs> and in spite of that, this field comes up for sale, and he buys it. He buys it, even though Nebuchadnezzar is sitting on it. He's sitting on it, but he buys it saying, we'll be back. We will not be dispossessed from the sun. I'm going to buy it. And he does. And I'm going to come back. And that just goes to the promises of God. It's the same thing. So if you have promised, when you promise salvation, that's why this one saved, always saved, take it to the bank. Take it to the bank. That's the depth of the riches of mercy and grace of God. You cannot be dispossessed. Period. Period. Okay. Well, that's a good word. That's a good word. So we'll pick up there next week with this land and we'll look at the last of the